Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I bring these updates to you so that you can stay in the loop about all things Starship, spaceflight launches from the past week and everything else that I think is cool. And we once again have a bunch of stuff to cover, from a record-setting Falcon Heavy mission, Starlink Group 5-6, China prepares its latest space station mission, Expedition 69 conducted another spacewalk, and some bad news for the Dragonfly mission. All of this and more in store, so let's kick off. Can you believe it has been two and a half weeks since we got to watch the Starship orbital flight test? Okay, well, maybe you can. But can you believe it's been two years since the historic SN15 test flight? The first and only time a Starship has performed a high altitude flight test with successful touchdown. There's not really a lot else to this story, but I just wanted to acknowledge this bit of historical anniversary, whatever you want to call it, this week. <laughs> Starbase Surfer captured an amazing close-up of the heat shielding on Ship 28, which is currently still in the high bay being worked on. SpaceX are definitely improving with each vehicle. Ship 28 may well be the next Starship to fly to orbit. We've still not had concrete confirmation on whether or not it'll be Ship 25 or 28, or another ship entirely, for the next orbital flight test. Elon stated on Twitter Spaces that this was still being debated internally. Heck, Ship 29's construction is coming along really well. Nick Ansuini captured its nose comb being moved in the high bay last week. But speaking of Ship 25, how's it doing? Well, after being fairly inactive down to the former Macy's gun range site, last week SpaceX restarted its test campaign, with some cryoproofing tests on the 5th of May. Judging by the frost line on the side of the vehicle, it looks like both the liquid oxygen and the liquid methane tanks were loaded with cryogenic fluid. If this is an indication that SpaceX are moving forward with Ship 25 as the next in line for orbit, then we can hopefully expect some static fires from this thing in the not too distant future. A lot of folks subscribe to the belief that Ship 25 is too similar to Ship 24 and that SpaceX will want to pair Booster 9 with a newer Starship for the next orbital mission. I can't say I would disagree with this logic, so it does beg the question why SpaceX are pressing ahead with tests for this vehicle. There are two potential theories here. One, the issue with the orbital flight test was with the booster, not the ship, so right now SpaceX don't consider having the latest and greatest Starship upper stage as a high priority, or two, the flight termination system was inadequate during the test flight. It was triggered about 40 seconds before the rocket actually disintegrated, and this has been confirmed by Elon, which is way too slow. Disintegration should be immediate when a self-destruct command is sent. With this in mind, perhaps SpaceX want to test out an upgraded termination system. Fly Ship 25 solo, like the SN8-15 test flights that we saw back in 2020 and 2021 and perform a termination test at high altitude or something else entirely let me know what you think in the comment section down below and hey while you're down there don't forget to drop a like on the video to help us out and of course if you're enjoying what you see here then do consider subscribing so that you get these space news videos in your feed every single monday down at the launch site, repairs are still underway following the devastation caused by the rock tornado generated by the orbital launch. It looks like SpaceX are making much more rapid progress than we all predicted, which of course is only a good thing. Lab Padre's cameras captured the arrival of new pipeworks, as well as new pile driving machinery, which will definitely be put to work. We have seen lots of heavy machinery swarming the launch pad, removing chunks of rebar and concrete to get it ready for rebuild. Large sections of pipework and shielding that were damaged during the launch were removed as well. We also saw SpaceX reinstall the second staircase to one of the orbital launch mount legs and replaced and repaired a good proportion of the protective cladding on the launch tower itself. Overall, they are absolutely flying along with repairs. Perhaps Elon's prediction of reflight readiness in six to eight weeks may not have been quite so unrealistic after all, though I'm certainly still skeptical of another flight that soon. We'll just have to wait and see. Over at the build site, the new high bay has finally started going vertical. Nick Antuini captured white framework going up, and if the build pace of the other buildings is anything to go by, we should start seeing this thing fly up very quickly. Have a look at this amazing photo from Sean Cannon of the Falcon Heavy 006 launch last Monday, with those 27 Merlin engines driving the rocket into the sky. Yep, this launch was definitely the highlight of the week. For this mission, the rocket placed three communication satellites into geosynchronous Earth orbit, a feat so challenging that for this mission, SpaceX needed to squeeze every ounce of power out of the massive Falcon Heavy. 
meaning that there was no room to recover any of the boosters. All three cores were detached with very little to no fuel remaining in order to achieve the crazy velocities required. In the process, quite a number of records were broken. Not only was this the first Falcon Heavy launch to expend all three first stage cores, but all that extra power meant that Falcon Heavy set the record velocity at main engine cutoff, screaming along at a staggering 17,077 kilometers per hour, or nearly five kilometers per second. This mission was also the second time that Falcon Heavy launched with a gray band on its second stage. This is here because of the second stage's long coast between burns. The grey colour allows for more heat from sunlight to be absorbed to warm the RP-1 kerosene tank, as RP-1 freezes at a much higher temperature than liquid oxygen, and if it gets too cold it becomes viscous and slushy, and ingestion of the fuel in this state by the engines would at best prevent ignition, or at worst completely destroy the upper stage Merlin engine. We first saw the use of a grey band on Falcon Heavy for the USS F-44 mission. Check out this video shared by SpaceX of the fairing re-entry. This was the hottest and fastest fairing re-entry that SpaceX have ever attempted, with the fairings re-entering the atmosphere at over 15 times the speed of sound. Look at that plasma trail being generated. While SpaceX were able to recover the fairings successfully, they haven't confirmed whether or not they'll be able to use them again. In the video, you can see smoke vapour being produced from the fairing interior, so these might be toast. We'd love to be proven wrong though. Kyle Montgomery captured the moments where recovery ship Doug arrived back at port, and these close-ups do seem to show the fairings largely intact, but of course we can't really tell how structurally healthy they are. Falcon Heavy wasn't the only SpaceX launch from the past week, they also pulled off another Starlink mission on the 4th of May, Starlink Group 5-6, which saw a Falcon 9 carry 56 satellites to low Earth orbit from Cape Canaveral. Following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed on the a short fall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. This first stage booster was B-1069, which had previously supported six missions, CRS-24, UTELSAT Hotbird 13F, OneWeb 15, SES 18 and 19, and two Starlink missions. Bad news for Dragonfly now, this is a very exciting upcoming mission in which NASA will send a flying rover to Saturn's moon Titan. Unfortunately, a big chunk of money could be taken away from the mission's budget, and that might cause some changes to the mission or its schedule, according to a top project official. The proposed budget for 2024 is about 20% less than what Dragonfly received in 2023. Dragonfly is currently scheduled to launch in 2027 and land on Titan in 2034. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson has assured Congress that the cut won't delay the mission's launch, but 20% is a lot of money. I'm hoping that the Dragonfly team can still pull this mission off in the way they envisioned it. An eventful week unfolded outside the International Space Station as Expedition 69 cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Petalin embarked on another spacewalk. Working with the European Space Agency's robotic arm, they successfully relocated an experiment airlock from the RASPED module to the Nyorka Multipurpose Laboratory module. This spacewalk marked their third joint venture, during which they connected power cables and completed the insulation of the airlock. The experiment airlock, initially launched in May 2010 aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis, serves the purpose of transporting payloads outside the International Space Station for applied science research. The duo are scheduled for their next spacewalk on the 12th of May. In further Space Station news, the Crew-6 team donned their suits and entered the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft on the 6th of May in order to disengage from the Harmony module's zenith port, flying around and then redocking at the module's forward port. This manoeuvre opened up the Harmony Zenith port for the upcoming docking of the Axiom 2 crew, who will be arriving on board the Dragon Freedom spacecraft after launching on the 21st of May this year. It's not just the International Space Station that saw some newsworthy activity last week. China's space station also saw some updates. On the 5th of May, the Tianzhou 5 cargo spacecraft was undocked from the Tianhe core module and started an independent flight stage, meaning that it'll fly solo, detached from the station, for a few weeks. It'll then be redocked to the front port of the Tianhe core module after the departure of the Shenzhou 15 crew spacecraft. The next cargo spacecraft, the Tianzhou 6, is ready for launch this week. The Long March 7Y7 rocket is ready and waiting to launch from the Wenchang spacecraft launch site. But that's about all from me this week. I hope you enjoyed today's space news coverage and of course are enjoying the magnificent list of names on screen. They're my Patreon and channel members and it's their generous support that makes all of this content possible. If you want to see your name there then follow the links in the description or join Patreon via the card on screen. Otherwise consider checking out either of the two videos that are there. 
Sorry for the lack of KSP content recently. Things have been super hectic for me in real life this past week or so, but things should be calming down again soon, so I should be able to make more Space Frog videos for you again in the not-too-distant future.